Hi everyone, my name is Yasmin and I'm a PhD student at UBC and today I'm going to talk a bit about my upcoming dissertation research titled Earthling Ties and Moral Cries, Theorizing Recruitment into Animal Rights Activism. So here's an overview of the presentation today. I'm going to talk a bit about the animal rights movement as well as the relevance of networks and moral shock. And then I'm going to switch over to alienation, um, or alienation from the non-human world, and specifically uh, the importance of interspecies ties to the animal rights movement. And then I'm going to talk about one example of this, which is bearing witness. Then I'm going to jump to my one of my research questions, uh, hypotheses, and some of my proposed methods. So just to frame the overall presentation, I'm presenting my research question here, which is, what promotes animal rights activism? So the animal rights activist uh, movement is one of the fastest growing social movements today. And this is partly linked to the tremendous growth in animals that are being used in the animal agriculture industry, uh, making it arguably the leading cause of animal suffering. So alongside the, the growth in the use of animals, there's also been a rise in veganism and animal rights activism. And with this, there's also been a rise in anti-vegan and anti-animal rights sentiments, or uh, also known as vegan phobia. And this kind of reaction could make it difficult to recruit individuals into the movement because there's uh, related costs to it. So this is actually a really interesting question, not just to the animal rights movement, but to other social movements too, to see what helps overcome this obstacle to recruitment. The animal rights movement is also very relevant to people interested in other movements as well, because it's high re highly related to other movements, for example, uh, in the fact that human oppression is very often related to animal oppression. And, as well, uh, it's very connected to the environmental movement. Uh, and indeed, uh, climate change is, our, is one of the most important issues facing our society today. And the image here uh, is a picture taken of Animal Rebellion, uh, which is an extension of Extinction Rebellion, which connects the issue of climate change and environmental destruction with the animal agriculture industry. So now we're switching gears a bit to networks. And uh, networks are a way to picture social structure. They're very useful for that. And a very good definition of networks is that it includes a set of actors or nodes and a set of relationships connecting these pair of nodes. And one of the core concerns of social network analysis is to understand how social structures facilitate and constrain opportunities, behaviors, and cognitions. And what we're looking at here is a very famous network. It's a, near, it's a marriage network of powerful families in Renaissance Florence. And if you look near the bottom, you'll see the Medici family. And they have the highest number of ties to other families. And this provides a hint of why they were so powerful during this time. So moving from the bird's eye view, we can go to networks on the ground. And the picture above is an image of Mississippi Freedom Summer activists in 1964, where people went there to register as many African American voters to vote as possible. And of course, this was a very high risk and high cost activism, as there was a high risk of being arrested. And activists also faced extreme violence from others. So uh, McAdam finds that having strong ties to others in the movement really helped uh, activists uh, participate because it provided the necessary social support. Um, on the other hand, the image below is, in, is a picture of uh, Clayquot sound protesters. Uh, they were protesting the clear cutting of an old growth forest in BC. Um, and it's a relatively low risk and low cost kind of activism. And Tyndall finds that having weak ties is uh, sufficient to get people uh, recruited. 
So switching over to the animal rights movement, we have every reason to believe that networks matter as well. Um, the above image is a picture of uh, an example of high risk and high cost activism. And it's a picture of activists uh, occupying a pig breeding farm in Quebec. And of course, they faced the risk of being arrested and facing criminal charges. And conversely, uh, the image in the bottom is a picture of people marching on the streets for animal rights. And this is relatively low risk and low cost activism. So uh, we can assume that weak ties might be enough to get people recruited. And indeed, Cherry finds that um, in a study of vegan, a vegan punk network, that having ties to other people in this community facilitated a smoother transition towards veganism and helped people maintain their ethical convictions. And in the animal rights movement specifically, Lowen Ginsberg find that activists perceive family and friends to be very important to recruitment and think networks matter. So back to my research question, what promotes animal rights activism? It seems that networks are an important factor. Another important uh, ingredient in animal rights activism seems to be moral shock, which Jasper identifies. Uh, um, Jasper defines moral shock as any unexpected event or piece of information that raises such a sense of outrage in a person that she becomes inclined towards political action. And indeed, uh, in their study, Jasper and Polson find that Networks matter less to recruitment in the animal rights movement and that actually moral shocks matter a great deal more. And relatedly, Hansen and Jacobson find that even after being recruited in the animal rights movement, activists continue to expose themselves to what they call micro shocks uh, and they watch footage of uh, the animal agriculture industry even after they're committed to the movement. So here's what I think. I think that networks and moral shock matter. And what we're looking at here is a picture of my sister, my niece, and I at the last Animal Liberation March in Toronto. And indeed, ever since I was little, my sister would say to thing, things to me like, Yasmin, flesh is for zombies. And this really colored my experience of walking through the grocery store. And I remember I've always had, and I still have a really hard time walking through the meat aisle, especially just picturing the kinds of horrors that would happen to turn a living sentient being into a piece of uh, consumable flesh. Um, and also in, uh, in a related note, Pelota finds that uh, that individuals that have animal rights ties, they start seeing exploitation everywhere, uh, making them more open to experiencing moral shocks. So back to the research question, what promotes animal rights activism? Uh, looks like networks and moral shock are really important, but I argue that there's one more ingredient that's missing here, and that's overcoming our alienation from non-human animals. So Marx and Engels talk a lot about how the conditions of labor under capitalism led to our alienation from ourselves or our species being in our humanity, uh, also alienation from others and nature. Um, and one thing that uh, people don't talk about as much is that Marx and Engels talk uh, about our alienation from the non-human world as well and focus on this a uh, great deal. Um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but they argue that by distancing ourselves from our creativity and the non-human world, we lose our very humanity. This is a very poignant remark there. And again, Marx, in terms of our alienation from nature, he noted how our move to urban centers re uh, resulted in accumulation of waste in cities and it wasn't replenishing the soils and this led to soil depletion issues and overuse of fertilizer, which can be very disastrous for the environment. 
And fostering Magdoff, extend this to factory farming. And what we're looking right now is an overshot of a factory farm and the waste accumulating in the center and just poisoning the soil and the water. Benton also talks about alienation of workers with regards to the animal agriculture industry and how it not only de-skills the worker, but it also uh, removes any moral regard that individuals have for non-human animals because they are completely objectified now. And as we know, uh, slaughterhouse workers are among the biggest victims of having to witness the kind of violence that is involved in killing an animal, killing almost a hundred or hundreds or a thousand of animals per day. And Dickens um, brings our attention to the fact that secrecy is one of the central forces maintaining our alienation from these animals. And he says that it takes events such as seeing a slaughterhouse truck drive by you to actually realize what's going on. On a more positive note, Benton talks about the importance of forming interspecies ties, and not just any tie, but an affective tie, a, a friendship, a bond that really solidifies the, the, the issue of animal rights in our minds and our hearts. And he warns that trying to convince people that animal rights is an important thing to achieve is not going to work if they don't have ties to these non-human animals. So an example of a kind of activism that's helping to break through this alienation is bearing witness. Because when we're there, we're interacting with these animals, we're, we're, we're giving them water if it's a really hot day, you know, we're, they're coming and they're smelling us. Uh, we're, we're really connecting with them. And it also shatters the secrecy because we see the conditions that they're coming in before slaughter um, and we're able to document this. Oh, and other kinds of activism that, uh, are, that are examples of breaking through alienation could include visiting a sanctuary farm and volunteering there, or doing something more high risk or high cost like a slaughterhouse occupation, or even an open, open or a secret rescue. So back to my research question, what promotes animal rights activism? Uh, networks and moral shock uh, seem very important, but I'm also arguing that interspecies ties is a crucial factor for animal rights specifically. Uh, so a more specific uh, expression of my research question is, to what degree does each factor influence participation in animal rights activism? And again, I think that all three matter, including non-human ties. So my hypothesis, of course, is that moral shocks, including the micro shocks that Hansen and Jacobson talk about, as well as their human ties specifically to animal rights activists and sympathizers with the movement will be important, as well as our non-human ties, especially ties to these farmed animals. And that all of these will be important in promoting ongoing and higher risk activism. And I'll just add that in terms of higher risk and higher cost activism, my hypothesis is that having stronger or closer ties to humans and on humans will be a crucial factor. So some of my proposed methods include surveys uh, to get very basic information on animal rights activists' personal networks, including their non-human ties, as well as interviews with anyone that's willing. And in terms of quantitative analysis, I'm looking to do a network regression, which is very similar to a standard OLS regression, but it helps to account for the dependencies that might be present in the network data. And finally, a qualitative analysis to really get in-depth knowledge about the kind of processes that are going on, you know, people's experiences of moral shock and their perceptions of the impact of having human and specific human and non-human ties on their activism. So uh, that's it. Thank you so much for, for uh, listening and I really look forward to hearing everyone's questions. Thank you, Yasmin. Uh, it was very clear and well done. Thank you. Um, we're just looking through the chat now to see if anyone has posted questions so far. Look. I, but we have a beautiful comment from Corey that their photos are great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Eric's wondering 
um, if people are more involved in other social activism, oh, sorry, if people more involved in other social activism are more likely to also become animal activists, the connection between different other types, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely, definitely the case. Um, I know that a number of Earth First activists, uh, for example, uh, were animal rights activists beforehand. So there's definitely tons of overlap, you know? And um, I, I recently read, it was, I believe it was by Pello and Brem. They were talking about this new frame that's appearing in radical ecological and animal rights movements uh, that is a total liberation frame, right? Which um, as we know, animal rights activists, anybody that cares about animals is probably gonna be more likely to care about humans as well. Um, and there are a number of studies showing that um, there's, a, there's a strong correlation between caring about animals and caring about the environment and all sorts of social justice issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Corey, you had a Corey? question. Did you yeah. wanna ask that? Yeah, thanks. Uh... Very cool. I'm actually doing some research on moral shocks right now and motivation, sustained motivation for veteran activists. So this actually bounces off the previous presentation that uh, Stephanie gave about the psychological costs, and I'm interested in burnout, compassion, fatigue. And with um, Jasper, he was making the argument that moral shocks motivate people, but in private correspondence with me, he's also argued that these moral shocks continue to be relevant to kind of micro shock people. And actually some, a couple of people published in society and animals journal on this, but he was making the argument that you need to keep exposing yourself to this. Otherwise you'll drop out of the movement. And it's been my, and mm. my experience and the experience of many of my long-term activist friends that we actively avoid those types of images. And we avoid those. Like I can't even look at my Twitter feed. I have a permanent post on my Twitter feed that I don't look at my Twitter feed because I cannot be exposed to that anymore. So that's what my research is on. I want to look at like the long-term use of moral shocks for veteran activists. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Have you thought about that? Uh, well, yeah, I've, I've, I've thought about my personal experiences of, of uh, having too much exposure to moral shocks. And I, and I do actively try to avoid it as well. Um, and I, I'm not too familiar with um, the kinds of um, things that might promote activism in terms of the moral shocking images. I, I'm not really sure if, if it is more important for just the initial recruitment, which I know Jasper was saying that it's more, it's, it's very important, especially when somebody doesn't have any ties to the movement, that these morally shocking images are critical and more important to your networks, uh, more important than your networks to get you recruited. Um, and again, my, my, my position on that is I think that, um, of course, moral shocks are going to be important to get people involved at first. I also think that networks matter a lot. And even if you don't have ties to people in the movement itself, just having a sympathetic tie, somebody that, you know, cares about animals, I think that goes a long way. Um, my personal uh, experience or what I've seen so far with other activists is they do, they, a lot of them seem to be experiencing burnout and they do actively try to avoid seeing these images and some of them even avoid bearing witness uh, in the future. Some of them don't bear witness anymore because it becomes too much. So I'm not really sure if that's just, um, you know, a minority of people and most people can handle it, but I know for myself that I've been doing this for at least a year now, and I have to have a whole day after bearing witness where I just cry. So, yeah, I so I don't know. I'm more on your side. Yeah, I think. I was shocked I think that you're, you're right. because I'm one of those people. I have they they do a lot of export protests every week uh, in Ramsgate, and it's like 20 minutes down the road from me. And I've never done it, nor will I ever be able to do it. I just cannot. Um, but I also wonder. Liz hinted at this in her presentation about Jasper. I wonder if he actually is an animal rights activist himself. I don't know that he is. And he may not be firsthand familiar with, you know, people who are especially empathetic who become long-term activists, you know, animal rights activists. Well, that's really interesting. With ja my impression at first with Jasper that he was not an animal rights activist, and he 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 he's not particularly interested in animal rights outside of thinking about uh, how to theorize about recruitment. But there's something I I uh, read recently in a book that he that he edited. Um, where, oh no, actually it was The Art of Moral Protest, where um, 
it was a really useful um, distinction that he made between um, people who are for animal protectionism, like animal welfare, for example, and people really for animal rights. And he talks about uh, the specific moral emotions involved in both and how people uh, arguing just for protectionism feel a kind of pity, which is a kind of moral emotion where you're more distanced uh, from, from the other individual, where you almost objectify them, right? And he, he distinguishes that from the sympathy or compassion that's inherent in animal rights activism and how the difference between pity and sympathy or compassion makes for very different movements and very different tactics. So I guess, I don't know if I answered my question. I'm not, I'm, I, I sort of doubt he is an animal rights activist, but I think he, he has a lot of really useful insights for us. Thank you. That was actually really useful, that last bit. I'll have to look that up. Awesome. <laughs> So we have, we have several more questions, but not that much time. So um, maybe we could probably do one more. Yeah, so maybe one more question. One more, um, I think yeah. Roger was next. Yeah, um, so was maybe if we can make the question quick and then I can email um, or private message Yasmin the rest of the questions. So you can address those particular issues. Does that work? So Roger, did you want yes. to ask your question? Yeah, I really want to just do, uh, it's a bit of a jumble of ideas really uh, in relation to the burnout uh, uh, one and then and then what we've just uh, heard from Yasmin and really following up from what Corey said, um, I, I'm a long-term vegan, um, I went vegan in 1979. I've never seen, I've never seen earthlings all the way through and I, I, I've never even clicked on something like Dominion because I, I, I don't need to. But um, I was interested in this thing because he, Tom, Tom Reagan um, he said there's an, a movement problem, which he called the revolving door, that we kind of recruit one and then we lose one. And a lot of that is to do with burnout. And at the same time, the ones who stay vegan, they're usually the ethical vegans, to use that phrase. And so it's a bit of a knotty problem here. And I just wondered whether, you know, there's, there's, there's anything in the research about moral shocks which, which, would, which would help us re, um, retain people as much as recruit them. That's a really good point, Yasmin. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's really great. I'm it's very really interested in that issue too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think that um, moral shocks, Jasper is speaking to the initial recruitment at first, and, he, and he's talking about how if somebody is just, nobody in their network is an activist, how moral shocks can be the crucial factor uh, getting someone to join the movement and to care. Um, uh, in terms of long-term recruitment, um, you know, Hanson and Jacobson, um, uh, as it was mentioned, they, they, they've noticed that some activists do continue to expose themselves to, to this footage. So maybe this might be important to some activists. Um, in terms of, in terms of long-term commitment, I, I recall a reading, um, I believe it was, um, um, Corey Lee Wren's second last book, it was it about uh, rationality in the animal rights movement, uh, how she was talking about um, people who really stay vegan, for example, are the ones who uh, go over the, the, the very ethical reasons to do it as opposed to, to health and environment. And am, I, am I correct, Corey? <laughs> Yeah, there's lots and lots of research when they survey, why did you go vegan? Why did you, why'd you become animal rights? And, and empathy for other animals is the number one motivator. Yeah, over and over. Yeah, um, so yeah, there you go. And, and, I, and I think that um, the, uh, our alienation from animals is a crucial factor. And I do think that things like going to bear witness or taking your friends to a sanctuary or something is gonna be, uh, is only going to get people involved. I, I've heard from a number of people that the quickest way to get someone to go vegan is to bring them to a vigil. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. There's a lot of, of discussion going on in the chat, which is so wonderful to see. Um, so you've, you've sparked some ideas and, and, and people are thinking and, and wanting to talk about it. So this is, this is exactly what we love to see. So thank you. Thank you. Well done. <laughs>